This is why I can't talk about it, is that it's just like it's yesterday. I, I still see them. Hundreds and hundreds of people. To be truthful, you have to really look back to that era and say that every gay man wondered what was going to happen. It was, I would say, universal. I'd heard, you know, that some people had died, but uh, it was very sudden, and it was not uh, any kind of prolonged illness or anything like that. It was just, um, they're dead, and it was this thing, you know, that didn't even have a name yet. We thought that maybe there was something that we were all doing that was particularly causing this, whether it was the use of recreational drugs or what we're called poppers, you know, we just didn't know. So I think that we were as confused as anyone as to whether or not it was something about what was considered the kind of the typical lifestyle of young gay men in the late 70s, early 80s. to have cases in King County in 82 and uh, so it was very scary. Uh, people lost weight, they had bluish purple lesions on their faces and various parts of their body. They had fevers and night sweats and nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And sometimes would just sort of have so much diarrhea that they couldn't absorb anything and, and just, you know, proceed to die. Here in Seattle, we could keep people alive maybe a year or two beyond when they would actually develop AIDS. But uh, typically at that point, they would, their immune system would be so shot that there wouldn't be much we could do. We think of medical science in this era as having relief uh, or curative possibilities in most situations, either surgically or a medical regime or wonder drug, something. But the early days of the AIDS uh, at the epidemic confounded everybody because None of that worked. How could anything be gay related that made absolutely no sense from a medical perspective? The symptoms associated with this, everything from cavity sarcoma to pneumocystis pneumonia were, seemed to be all over the board as far as a health crisis that, what in the world was going on? How specifically was this transmitted? Who was gonna get it and how were people getting it? The call to close down the bathhouses, the radical right religious folk saying that this was some sort of judgment, the outing of people who had never been, been open about their sexual orientation before. It was uh, a health crisis, but it was also a, a civil rights crisis. These stories are true um, of people being evicted from their apartments uh, because neighbors were fearful, landlords were fearful, uh, being fired immediately from their jobs, maybe overtly, but, but also covertly. And so those were tangible problems. When I went to my dentist, uh, after it became really clear that there was something going on in the gay community, a disease that might be communicable, and the first time I went to him after that, he was covered from head to foot in masks, protective eyeglasses, uh, gloves, gown, uh, to an, an extent that I had never seen before. Physicians should know who's high risk and who isn't. And it bothers me that ambulance drivers still panic when they hear that someone has AIDS. I've just this week had someone refuse to do and an, finish an autopsy when it was suspected that the person might have AIDS. I've had funeral homes uh, charge extra when AIDS was suspected. Uh, there's a hysteria that absolutely should not be because we know what the facts are. The fact is we already Everyone was petrified of AIDS, even though we knew it is not as contagious. All of the hospital personnel gowned and masked and put gloves on and, and always kept their distance from the patients. And uh, it was a very isolating experience. 
one fellow who had an incredible will to live, and he was always reading the newspapers and hoping there would be a breakthrough. Finally, he did give up, and I remember the nurses telling me that um, he had been in coma since the night before. And so I just went in briefly to see how he was doing. And when I put my hand on his wrist, um, he sensed that I was there. And <laughs> even though he supposedly had been in coma, he said, thank you, doctor, for everything. And then he passed away about 20 minutes later. The events hadn't reached sort of that critical mass where the mainstream media was terribly interested. And, um, and at the community level, uh, the resources were not as good as they are today. And so most gay papers wrote something, but not much. And fortunately, the SGN in that era got very involved and began printing every piece of information we could get, any opinion, any ideas, any numbers that we basically kind of got a reputation, in fact, from some people doing too much AIDS coverage. But my feeling was that that's what we should do because this was going to be something that would affect everybody. And I think, unfortunately, that turned out to be largely true. Steve and I started going together very early on. We were in our uh, early 20s when we met. If we could have gotten married, we would have gotten married. Uh, I do remember the old Beach Boys song that went, wouldn't it be nice if we could marry? Steve got uh, terribly sick and he went pretty fast. He uh, developed pneumocystis, which is a kind of pneumonia, and then he also developed Kaposi's sarcoma. And the KS was devastating. It uh, disfigured him. It created purple blotches all over his face and his body. And Steve was a very, very handsome man. And I, I remember him saying to his doctor, because no one survived AIDS, uh, he said, uh, just make me feel good and make me look good, because the KS was very disfiguring. I remember the doctor who was taking care of Steve said, you know, Steve, we're at the end of our rope. And I thought, oh, he could have at least given him some hope. He could have said, <laughs> he could have said, we're doing the best we can. You could construct a scenario where the gay community would have said, well, these people are sick, they're dangerous, they're pariah, they're untouchables. We're not going to do much except avoid them. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. The community began to organize. That's what we could do. That's what we could do. I helped form an AIDS vigil in 82. The Gay Pride March had lots of uh, messages about AIDS early on. A foundation formed which was called the Northwest AIDS Foundation which began to work with mainstream people. The dedication was uh, tremendous. People were giving away many hours and many dollars. It wasn't just uh, a, a tokenism. This was very, very engaging. Your friends were dying. People you had known for 20 years were sick. My condition has not improved, but neither has it worsened. 90% of the people who had AIDS three years ago are dead today. I'm still alive two and a half years later and I'm alive and kicking honey. Bobby Campbell was a very, very important early person in this epidemic. He decided after he was diagnosed with AIDS that he would become a very out national voice about the epidemic. We set up a forum in Seattle to have Bobby come and speak. And that was probably the first large public gathering, public invited, 
to talk about this epidemic and have a person with AIDS be on the stage talking to everybody. I'd go to an apartment and by this time they had become destitute and had no roommate and had no one uh, involved in their life and perhaps lived in public housing. And so you'd see a very, very modest, very simple home, uh, but maybe very um, exotically decorated uh, or maybe not decorated at all with little or no food in the house, maybe just some uh, supplements and more medications than you can shake a stick at, and someone who was almost skeletal, uh, but typically someone who was uh, very proud and pretty much um, humbled, or somebody who was uh, furious, or somebody who had given up, but typically somebody who was very, very grateful that you were there. And they usually showed that gratitude by uh, snapping your head off <laughs> or by crying. And uh, you would deliver groceries or uh, s something that had been donated to the agency. And you spend a few minutes and uh, hold their hand or make the bed or say it's time for us to make it to the doctor. Can I help you down to the car and uh, do what you needed to do? Say, what do you want to do today? You know, we've got about a half an hour to spend together. Shall we work on a letter to your mom? I think it's a difficult thing to describe because it wasn't as negative perhaps as people think, at least for me. I think the, the sense of mutual grieving was therapeutic because it broke through the isolation and that's more debilitating, trying to suffer through an agonizing uh, situation where there is no end in sight and no easy uh, remedy for your emotions and your grief um, was the real problem. And so when people came together in groups and, uh, and commiserated, that was very therapeutic because you saw tons of people, hundreds of people that you knew casually or knew well, you hugged, you shed a tear, you were there in some sort of communal sense, grieving and dealing with the situation together. And so I think that Part of the early AIDS uh, epidemic vigils and the, the processes that were happening where we met in collective action were very, very therapeutic. Yes, lots of emotion, lots of tears, lots of angst because you felt so desperately burdened by, by the immensity of, of the people dying around you. So many people, so many lives, so many families. 
the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. It was a waterfall. You barely get to know one person and then there are three more right behind them. There was no easy way to deal with that. There still isn't. I think um, many of us cried every day for years. Brian was a party guy, you know, I mean, he was all over the place and he was very popular and, you know, cute young thing. <laughs> and, um, and he was really, you know, feeling his oats. It was, he was, you know, in his 20s and early 20s. He was having a good time and nobody was thinking about what this was. One day I said to him, um, I'm worried about you. You know, he wasn't, it wasn't that he was sick, it was a sense that I had. I felt that after he came back from New York, he had dropped a lot of weight. I just felt like there's, you're, you're not as well as you should be. I was starting to say, there's a test. Have you been tested, you know, to him? And he never wanted to talk about it. He was very much in denial about it. I don't know anybody who has it. I don't want to talk about it. The less I know, the better. Um, he was very much sort of, what I don't know won't hurt me kind of attitude. The next time I called him, he was gone. His phone was disconnected at the store. He was staying at my dad's house and I called my dad and he said he's packed up the store and everything's in the garage and I don't know where he is. He didn't tell any of us where he was going or what he was doing. And we kind of felt like, okay, we'll hear from him when we hear from him. I got a call from the hospital saying that he had been brought unconscious by ambulance to the intensive care unit at Harborview. And he had pneumonia. He had pneumocystis. And he was unconscious for days. I don't even remember how long. But he was in the hospital over a week, and most of that time he was unconscious. He lived 10 months from the time he was diagnosed with AIDS. And that's really when he got the most politically active around HIV and AIDS. He was in the paper, and every time somebody turned around, they said, oh, your brother this and your brother that, and he was involved in marches, and he was involved in ACT UP, which he helped to found here in Seattle, educating people, connecting with people, getting the word out, and he sat on the governor's commission on HIV AIDS, and he was just extremely active. The last week of his life, he had a seizure, went into a coma, was in a coma for a week. And at the time, I'm not sure that my sister and I knew just how many people he had connected with and the kind of, of, of work that he'd been doing in the community. We had a memorial at the mortuary up on Broadway, and it was packed. It was such a testament to the work that he'd done in those 10 months, very short period of time. But Brian had made so many friends. His activism extended beyond his death because he set up the Brian Day Memorial Scholarship Fund, which is overseen by Pride Foundation. It's a leadership scholarship. It's not just continuing ed. We really wanted to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, a lot of guys in our community don't get the chance to get through education. We want to give them a step up. We want to be able to make a difference in their lives and make a difference in the communities of which they are a part. We heard about a hero the other day, and we thought you ought to hear about him, too. He's not a famous athlete. He's not on television. But in one of our Cairo Listens meetings with people in the community, we heard about Lenny Larson. From my early days, I was notorious for just being around. I've always been known as Lenny versus Leonard. Not easy to see your friends passing away one by one and not knowing technically what the cause was. Several of us realized we wouldn't be able to get by without extra funding, so I said, well, why don't we put out canisters? I started my jars and bars canisters in 87. The first year, I only raised $3,000 for AIDS. 
at the time that I actually finished my fundraising. I raised uh, a half a million dollars. We started uh, the Chicken Soup Brigade in a little corner store on Pike and Thomas. As a group, we went out to get donations of foods and so on, and uh, we did what we could to uh, cheer them up and help people with AIDS. Taking them to uh, doctor's appointments, uh, bringing them uh, orange juice and vitamins and uh, extra food whenever they might need it. These are the kinds of things that don't get written up in the information that you see about the Chicken Soup Brigade, but it's the kind of things that uh, really are at the core of people like Mr. Larson, and he deserves very much the honor that he's receiving today. I think uh, I did my part as I was able to and uh, until things really got going in the city and the people uh, recognized the need for health and health care. So it turned out I'm glad I was able to do it and still am of course. Uh, I think it's my healthy Swedish genes that are keeping me going and uh, we'll see what evolves when I get to be a hundred. So. <laughs> In January of 83, both my long-term partner and I uh, developed a fairly profound flu-like illness that probably was our first infection. We probably got infected almost simultaneously. Uh, then when I got tested, as soon as the test was available in the spring of 85, I discovered I had HIV. And uh, that sort of blew me out of the water. I didn't really know what to think of that. This is a program that we've started really because of the need to know how much disease is in the general community. The health department actually recruited me for this job and I took it in late 85 thinking uh, that I would probably not have a long career at that point and that I would try to make some contribution to my community and likely get ill and become disabled and die. I managed to keep the infection under control before the medicines that turned out to be so effective. And then in 86, I started on combination therapy and, and now my T cell count is essentially normal and my viral load is you know, undetectable, so the medicines are working. But we don't have a cure and I, I'm frankly thinking that we won't have a cure before I die probably. What I learned from this is that uh, there are people you can count on and there are people you can't count on. And you never know until a crisis hits who, who will be there working hard, standing with you, helping you, working for the community, and who will quietly disappear. Where did those people come from? Where did those people who had no dog in that fight, maybe who never even met a gay person, where did they come from? Where? I mean, you know, that's got to be grace. Had we not organized the community responses on our own, I would, I don't know what I could tell you would have happened. It was our finest moments in many ways, and the fruition that, um, that many of us who are activists uh, were so pleased by, because uh, it was so important, and we went to work, and we did what we needed to do.